Now I have the pleasure to uh, welcome Adam Krimble. If you can come, Adam. He's lecturer in digital history at the University of Hertfordshire. His researches explore the ways that digitization and the curation of historical data from diverse sources can provide us with new modes of understanding the history of 18th and 19th century society. And you have seen his um, interesting title, White Male North American Challenges of Diversifying the Programming Historian. Thank you, Adam. Welcome. Yeah, OK. OK, yeah, thank you very much um, for, for coming and for having me. What I wanted to do was just share a project that is, I think, in many ways similar in goals to the project we just heard. Um, and I'm going to focus more on some of the social aspects, some of the social problems that we've been trying to solve with our project. So if you're not familiar with the programming historian, um, this is something that's been going on for the last uh, five or six years, since 2012. I brought some stickers. I'll get you to pass those around so you can check out the website later. But uh, what we are is basically we're a, we're a publication where you can uh, submit a tutorial related to a digital skill or a digital humanities skill. It goes through a peer review process, and it's then uh, published on our website. So we think of it as a little bit of a mixture between uh, the submission system of a journal and what a traditional textbook might have done in the past. So it's, it's an ongoing, uh, growing resource. Uh, we've got contributions from over 120 academics around the world so far. Everything's open access. Everything's uh, quite sustainable. Uh, as I said, we've got no budget for this. We made that decision uh, on purpose. Uh, kind of sucks for me today because I had to pay to come here out of my own pocket. But otherwise, it's meant that we've been entirely free from institutional control. Uh, which has given us a lot of freedom. Uh, and we've got a lot of people using this. We've got 280,000 people in the last year who have used it. That's our, our, that's our user data. Uh, we're on pace for about 400,000 in the next year. So a lot of people. Uh, second biggest country is actually India. So we're having an impact outside of what we might call traditional humanities departments. We've got a whole wide range of resources, primarily targeted at historians, because we wanted something that uh, what, that we didn't feel was out there. We wanted tutorials that spoke the language of historians. Uh, and these are just a couple of the examples that we've got related to web scraping. So how to get data or get material off the web so that you can use it as uh, research material. Now, uh, this is a project that was originally founded by William Turkell, who uh, is based at Western University in Canada. That's where I was doing my master's degree at the time, so I was a student of his. And he created a series of tutorials on how to learn Python uh, and released this as an open access textbook. And um, I was quite keen at the time, and I said, well, why don't we open this up and turn it into a publication where people can actually submit material and it can go through this peer review process. And we've got then a series of high quality um, tutorials available for historians and whoever else wants to use them. And uh, that happened in 2011. Since then, we've had a number of people come and go to um, from the project team. But predominantly, those people have been people like me, people who look like me, people who sound like me, people who grew up in North America. Uh, and that, I think, has partly come down to the fact that it was a project that was originally started in Canada, and we called on our friends to join the team in the first instance. Uh, and perhaps in certain ways that we didn't intend, it ended up taking on some characteristics that maybe made it look friendlier to North Americans. We have very few European connections. We've only got one person on our team who is European. Other than me, I'm based in the UK, if you want to call me European. Um, but I'm culturally North American. So um, I think we've only got one person who's culturally European uh, on the team and who grew up in Europe. Now, we were quite keen to make this something that was going to be useful for people all around the world and for as many people as possible. And we wanted to make sure that there weren't barriers that were creeping into the project that was going to make us a North American project. And uh, so in order to serve that full potential, we decided to think about some of the ways that we might not be reaching um, particular audiences. And the two that I'm going to talk to you just briefly today about are uh, women. We noticed a problem with our lack of engagement from women, and also internationalizing um, and reaching out to other language communities. So uh, a 
2015, we noticed that only 23% of our authors, people contributing, uh, were women. And we thought, okay, well, this is not representative of the potential people who could be contributing to the project. What's going on? Are there barriers that have crept in that have made this an unwelcome space for these people deciding not to contribute? We wanted to know. Um, so we opened this up to uh, an anonymous discussion. People could submit survey um, data about what they thought was a barrier in our project. Um, we were not trying to suggest that there are certain things women aren't good at or that they can't do or that they can't learn. This is not about suggesting that at all, but it was about listening to the community and finding out what they thought we could do uh, to make it a more open community. And, and three things came back uh, as fairly repeated suggestions. Uh, the first was the submission system that we were using was quite technically heavy. And uh, it basically required you to, I'll use the technical term, to submit a pull request on GitHub. And I don't know how to do that. Um, I imagine a number of you don't know how to do that. A number of my team members thought that that would be okay because they knew how to do it. Uh, but this turned out to be something that was really putting off a number of people, both men and women. Uh, so we addressed this issue. We made it a bit simpler to um, submit a lesson. And this has, I think, probably helped not just women, but also uh, more men get involved in the process. Another thing that came up that people were concerned about, uh, this one surprised me actually because I didn't think this would be a problem, but we have an open peer review system, which means that everybody in the world can look in on what the editors and the authors and the reviewers are saying about a piece that's under review, and it's all done openly um, on the web. We did this because we thought that that would get rid of reviewer number three problem, which we've all experienced if you're in academia. The person who's a jerk uh, and just tells you that your work is complete crap. We thought if we, if we made them put their name on it, we'd get rid of reviewer number three. Um, but a number of, of female participants in the survey in particular suggested that they weren't always comfortable with this open peer review idea. Um, it leads them, op they felt that it left them open to uh, potential online um, abuse in various forms. So in order to address this, we have decided to opt for uh, an optional closed review. So it's, it's about adapting the community, or it's about adapting the project, I think, to the needs of uh, the members of the community. The last one was time. Um, a lot of people saying, I just don't have time to do this. And I'd be interested to hear what um, Daria Teach discovers in terms of this. Can, can you put this before your monograph or can you put this before your journal article that your department is, is demanding you to get out? Can you put it in front of your children who, who want your attention? There's not a whole lot I can do to give you more time, I'm afraid. Uh, we haven't totally been able to, to solve this problem. But one of the suggestions that we did have people come forth with was the idea that maybe they have a great idea but they don't have the time to completely finish it. So it would be helpful um, if a project like ours might be able to pair them up with somebody who does have the time, maybe a more junior scholar who's looking to get their name out in a particular way, um, and then they can work together on it um, and, and maybe overcome some of those problems. So we didn't manage to solve anything. And as I said, this is not about suggesting things women can't do, because I know women can do anything that men can do. But um, by listening to the community, I think it's given us a chance to reflect on some of the, uh, the biases that we had or some of the, the blind spots that we had in the project and uh, give people a chance to um, help us get better, I suppose. And the result of this has been an increase um, in the proportion of, of women contributing. So in the last year, it went from 23% up to 33%. So we're not quite there yet. Uh, we've also made an effort to make sure that when we're including new team members, that we're making sure that we're not overlooking uh, women or that we're encouraging women to apply as well. Because when we do get applications, they tend to be people that look and sound uh, like me. So we're going out of our way to find female reviewers um, and female team members. But it's, it's a work in progress, I think. The second thing that we were trying to do was to de-North Americanize the project slightly. And um, thankfully, we got an email from uh, this guy right here, uh, Victor Gale, who's in Mexico, uh, about a year ago saying, why don't we translate this project into uh, Spanish? And we thought maybe that sounded like a good idea. So what we did is we put out a call for Spanish language editors 
uh, got a number of people interested in doing this. And we put together a, a team of three people um, based in different countries, actually, around the Spanish-speaking world. And they've been working for the past six months on initially on translating the original 56 tutorials. Uh, but we don't want this to be a project where the English language is always privileged over the other languages. So what we're hoping that they'll do once that translation process is smoothed out a little bit is to start looking for um, Spanish-specific culturally appropriate um, lessons that maybe serve the Spanish community um, in a first go, rather than being translated uh, from English into Spanish. So we're hoping to create almost a parallel community here of um, uh, Spanish language uh, tutorials. And we chose Spanish because there's a lot of Spanish speakers in the world, but also because we've been approached. We've also had a couple of French speakers um, get in touch as well who are tentatively interested in, in doing something similar. We're starting with this just because it's a new idea for us and we want to make sure that we get it done um, properly before we uh, branch off into all sorts of different languages. But if there is anyone interested in increasing the localization, please do come find me um, sometime today or tomorrow and I'd be happy to uh, talk to you. It's something we're really excited about. We've just launched the first, I think, 18 tutorials in Spanish. So if you're part of this Spanish-speaking digital humanities world, um, I hope you'll take a look at it and um, let us know if there's something that you think that we should be doing to make it even uh, more useful. Uh, one of the things that's been really interesting for me, actually, in this process is, is learning about translation and how it's not just a matter of changing the words from one language to another. So uh, there was a lot of work going into uh, changing our tutorial examples into something that would make sense to a Spanish scholar. Uh, and one of the big challenges that we've discovered is that uh, Python, we've got a lot, of life, uh, a lot of lessons that are using the Python programming language. Python is written in English, so a lot of the, um, the core words that are used in the structure of the language, like for and if and, and while, these are all English language things. So it's, 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 it's taught me a lot, I think, about internationalizing um, projects just by going through this experience. But we're really excited to be branching out into um, new communities. And this is a map of our contributors over the course of the project. And you can see this is where we're getting this North American clustering that I'm trying to break forth from. Because as I said, our second biggest user group after the United States is actually um, in India, and almost exclusively in the Silicon Valley of India. So we've got a lot of people using this project in lots of different contexts. Um, my, my real energy and my focus is on, on dealing with some of these social problems, because I think great digital humanities projects uh, have teams in, of, of community or communities and teams behind them. Um, so there's a lot, I think, probably that we've already, we've already figured out about how to do this. So I'd be happy to talk to some of the Dare to Teach people. Um, but I'm sure you could teach us a lot about what you're doing as well. So this is just our little bit of, of what we're trying to do. So thank you very much. Maybe just one, one question. Okay, so you can exchange with Adam. Oh, sorry, Susan. So if you were to give us one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, if I was gonna give you one piece of advice, I, I would say it, make it a community project. People won't help you build your own house, but they'll help you build a community center. 